moment of inertia. Uh, and you could read this right out of your book basically, but it's a measure of the ability of a cross-sectional area to resist bending or buckling. Okay, so when we start talking about uh, columns or maybe a beam that we have to use to support some kind of a machine tool we're going to build, you know, or the base of a machine tool, or in your case of your uh, projects downstairs when you start looking at uh, uh, forks on a on a motorcycle or whatever you're building down there, then you're going to have to be able to to check and see what the moment of inertia of those uh, cross sections are so you'll be able to tell if you can resist that bending and buckling. All right. Greater the moment of inertia, the greater the resistance. Greater the cross sectional area though does not mean that it's going to have a greater moment of inertia. So be careful there. Uh, case in point, uh, think in terms of a drive shaft of a car. Drive shaft, well, at least on an old car. The drive shaft on an old car, it has a large diameter, but it has a very thin section, okay? as opposed to a piece of pipe that might have a smaller diameter, but have a really big cross section. That one that's spread out farther will take much more force than the one that the pipe that uh, has the thicker cross section. So, and it has the added benefit of being lightweight, doesn't it? So, that's Can you not. Explain that again. I don't get what you're saying about the pipe and the drive shaft. The the pipe and the drive shaft. The pipe may be a small. Let's let's draw it here. The pipe may be a small diameter. Well, if I can get my mouse. To, small diameter. And it may have a thick cross section, so the area in here may be larger than this drive shaft, which has a larger diameter. But a real thin wall, and I, I'm going to have a hard time drawing that real thin, but very thin compared to this thickness here. But in the overall scheme of things, this is going to have a better moment of inertia than this one. Okay? So uh, the, the section thickness doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to resist more. And some of that has to do with the distance. Okay? And in fact, that's what it says. You know, the, you know, I said the greater the cross section does not mean the greater the moment of inertia, but based on the distribution of the area relative to the reference axis, is where you're going to see the difference. Okay, so this one spreads out farther and has a better lever arm, essentially, is what's going on there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, We typically take the moment of inertia when we're looking at this relative to the centroid of the section. Okay, now, and in these problems, we'll be taking it relative to the, this would be the reference XX axis, and this is that. You know, when we looked at the centroid problems, we had the reference X axis and the reference Y axis, and then you actually have the centroidal axis, which is going to go through that area right there, isn't it? And the central, you'll have the centroidal XX axis and the centroidal YY axis. Okay. <laughs> so we'll be looking at, and moment of inertia is uh, referenced as a capital letter I. So we'll be looking at the moment of inertia about the X axis or the moment of inertia about the Y axis or relative to the X or Y. Okay, and that would be typically the centroidal, which is going to be, if you will, through the center. But the centroidal is the center of the gravity, right? Al? You said uh, that the moment of inertia is its ability to resist buckling or, or twisting? Right. Is it res resist bending or buckling? Bending or buckling. Okay, so it's, in other words, you're going to look at the, the the cross section of that part to see how it will resist bending, which will actually be the other axis, won't it? You know, this, if this were a piece of pipe, you're going to be putting a load on that piece of pipe this way, but you'll be looking at this section here. You'll be, in other words, you'd be cutting right through here, 
and looking at that section to see if it's going to be enough to resist that force that you're going to be putting on it. Okay? So that's what you're looking at. Okay, now, and where's that going to be pertinent? It'll be pertinent when we get to chapter uh, 9 through whatever, however far we get. You'll have to know the moment of inertia. Okay? So, and <laughs> they'll give you some moment of inertia on a lot of products. You'll already see that. So, that's something else that, uh, you know, they'll give you that depending on uh, where it is on the centroidal axis or so on. Meaning we won't have to calculate it all That's the time. correct. Yeah. The, that's already uh, been determined for cross sections of different shapes and such, depending on what type of material they've got. You can have the same cross section, whether it's steel or aluminum, and you're going to have different types of mass there, aren't you? So you're looking at an area, a moment of inertia, and you're talking about some mass there, and there will be differences in those moment of inertias. Uh, to, you, know, you know intuitively, don't you, that it's you know, typically, uh, if you've got the same cross-sectional area, steel is going to resist bending and buckling more than aluminum in it. Intuitively, you know that. Well, this is going to help you to do that mathematically. So that's what you're, that's what this is all about. Okay? Remind me too, before we get done, I want to, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I want to show you uh, how you can determine the uh, center of gravity or the centroids and even the moment of inertia using uh, AutoCAD. So, and then later on, if you have a solid object, you know, whether it's Inventor, SolidWorks, NX, uh, you can do that three dimensionally. So, it's pretty handy. Okay? So, uh, don't let me forget that, or if we, it, this may, we may end up going into Friday just for the explanation and such of this. We may end up waiting till Wednesday to take any test. Uh, I think it's probably going to take that long to get through it. So, Jabril, do you have a question? Okay. I thought I saw your hand go up there. Okay, so, um, there's also another thing we have to talk about there. Uh, well, and they they refer to this uh, in the book. Let's see, I've got my, let me get my pictures out here. Now, eh, that's not the one I wanted, darn it. Gotta go back a little farther. I want that to be smaller. I can deal with it. I can't see. Somewhere. Let's see if this will help. I don't know why that gets dim like that. I well, just that's not helping. Well, do it that way, huh? There we go. <coughs> and I don't know what happened. Why I ended up with. Um, this cough back again, that kind of bothers me. So this is uh, out of your book, the example uh, figure 8-2. So, and that's showing you an illustration of the centroidal axis. And that's going right through the center of this part. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> And I believe that handout that I gave you, which you, uh, is that, are there extra handouts back there somewhere? Jabril, there's a handout somewhere. Did somebody bring them back to me? Where are the handouts? Did you all get the handout? The new one? 
Okay, maybe they brought them back to me. I got some here. Here, there it is. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. If you look at the, uh, oh, what would that be? The second or third page? Now on the second page, table three there, if you look, you've, you've got the area, then you've got the moment of inertia, and you've got the IX uh, subscript O, then you've got the IY subscript O, and the IX. Okay. So, I don't know why that came up. So, if we looked at that, uh, what would we get? Somebody, I uh, didn't bring my calculator. What would we get if we said, uh, yeah, the basically the center of gravity uh, is going to take care of that for us, but type in... Uh, 8 times 16 cubed divided by 12. See if you get 8. You should. Oh, well, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that, that's all wrong. That, that's the moment of inertia. That's not going to give you 8. I'm looking at Y bar, duh. But Y bar for that is the centroidal axis on that. So that was chapter 7, wasn't it? Calculating Y bar. Chapter 7, right? Which is the height divided by 2 in this case. And which would have been, oh, quit coming up. Bottom? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, that would have been the first page, I guess, wouldn't it? Yeah area and centroids. So once you find that, then you have to find the moment of inertia. And in that case, then you would go to that handout on that second page, the moment of inertia for that particular piece. Again, it's going to be the moment of inertia for this. And that's signified by O for own, if you will, and the X axis right is the base times the height cubed divided by 12 and that's just simply 8 times 16 cubed divided by 12 get the calculation for that that should come out to be 2731 inches to the fourth <coughs> and that is the area with another dimension, if you will, to that. that. Or not the area, but the volume. And that's interesting to the fourth. They go into that discussion about uh, why that comes up interest to the fourth. And they go into, <laughs> oh, it's a complex thing. It's interest to the fourth. Enough said. Okay. Um, that's for that individual piece. Now, later on, we're going to have to talk about something where we have to use the transfer formula, which uh, will, and, and if we wanted to, we could use the transfer formula to uh, figure out the moment of inertia about the, the X reference axis, and we'll do that on a problem. And then we would have to get that eight inches uh, back into the calculation. So we'll be doing that. Uh, let's see what else about that. I guess if we note, if we did that about the y-axis, so that's the difference between the uh, x and the y-axis, think about it from this standpoint. If this were like a, a 2 by 4 or let's say a 2 by 10 okay, if you, if you take a 2 by 10 you're using that to put a, in a floor, right? If you, my mouse here, if you stand a 2 by 10 up like this to use it on a floor and you put a load on this, it's going to hold up pretty well, isn't it? It's not going to bend or buckle. But if you take that same 2 by 4 and set it this way and you put that force on it the same way, it's going to tend to want to buckle, isn't it? Okay. Well, if you're looking at that same one, 
and you're looking at it from you're looking at it using the xx in this particular one but if you were doing it from the yy and putting that same force this way that's why you might have to calculate the yy because you got a side force on it everything's not always going to be an up and down force is it so is the 2731 is that your 2731 that's your amount of force that is, just refer to that, it's the moment of inertia, the resistance to buckling, bending or buckling, for that shape as it's configured here. But I guess uh, what I'm asking, I don't know, maybe I'm not asking you right, is that the amount of force you can put? Nope. No? Okay. Nope. That's just what that cross-sectional area can handle. That's what its calculated value is for moment of inertia. That's all you can use it for. Okay, and then you have to n realize that based on that moment of inertia, what can it do later on, chapter 9 through so on, with resistance to buckling and such. Okay, and then you're shooting for the best value you can get there. All right, that's, I mean, that's about as far as we can go right now. And then you're going to use that number to plug it in when you start trying to figure out what what's going to make this thing buckle and you have to be able to work it both ways you'll get that number and try to figure out what kind of forces can I can I can it resist okay <coughs> excuse me and that that's where you're going to use it mostly they give you that value then you go back and say well you know what what can this cross section withstand so that's where you're going to be uh, headed but at times you might have to know what the YY value is and note in this particular shape the moment of inertia of its own shape there for the Y Y direction you change this to the height times the base cubed divided by 12 now note in my book on uh, let's see, on page 166, you might make a note of this, where they're trying to find the moment of inertia of uh, one particular piece. They've got the base times the height cubed. That should be the height times the base cubed. Where's that at? That is on page 166 they're looking for the yy centroidal axis on that and we're going to go through this example problem but i just wanted you to note <coughs> they're showing that it's they actually show it as the base times the height cubed divided by 12 as the formula but then they actually put the height times the base cubed divided by 12 in the in the uh, solution, solution. Yeah, they yeah. so they just you need to reverse those from B H to H B. So our our I O X is just the force is coming down vertically on it, and the I O Y is if that's coming. The force would be coming from the yeah. And then the the I X on our uh, handout here, that's just the centroidal axis. The the what now? What is that? Which one? The third formula. Is that what you're asking now? Yeah. No, that's going to be relative to the uh, to the x-axis. That's going to be, see, the ixo is relative to this axis right here. The centroidal axis, the O means for this particular part. This is relative to the centroidal axis. This is relative to the centroidal y-axis. And then the, uh, the other one that was just ix, is relative to this x-axis here okay. okay and they and they've actually got those labeled on the on the formula sheet okay oh, yeah, see where the xo is and the x and the y got it. okay hey these are all good questions oh except for the one he's going to ask no <laughs> go ahead brian <laughs> <laughs> Where are we at? On the third page? Yeah, third page. Yeah, you yeah, you'll have to 
if we've got it's going to be just like with the uh, center of gravity if you've got an area that is void you have to subtract it Oh, well, let's see, we're on a, a rectangle. Yeah, moment of inertia, third. Yeah. BD cubed divided by 12. Right. Divided by 12. BD cubed divided by 12. Yeah, that's the hollow, the hollow rectangle. All they're doing is taking the, the rectangle on the first sheet oh, yeah. <laughs> and subtracting one from the other one. Okay. And instead of, and I don't know why they don't call it BH, I, you know, especially since it came out of the same book. Okay. Yeah, but it would be. BH cubed minus uh, B1 H1 cubed divided by 12, you know, would be a better way of doing that. But yeah, you're just taking one rectangle and subtracting the other one out. Clark? Um, I'm trying to picture uh, the IX sub O versus IX. Where, where are we at? Uh, on the one we've been working on, the rectangle. Uh, like you're saying, the I, I X sub O is a force coming straight down relative to the centroid, and the other one is relative to the lower X axis. <coughs> it's coming down onto a part. How is that any different? It's going to hit the top of the piece. How is it different if you say it's relative to here or to here? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's basically where it's attached. What's supporting it? Where is it supported? It's supported, right? If you're you're basically taking part of your part of your uh, thing away, aren't you? So like if it was bolted together in some fashion versus just sitting on right the, the ground or something. Yeah. Right? Well, unless um, let's see now. That was about the center. They don't do it about the x axis, do they? Or about the x. So we'll do that here in a minute. So let's finish this one up. This is just. Then we take this, the 16 times the 8 cubed, divided by 12, right? What's that come out to? Does, did they do that? They didn't actually do that. Somebody punch that in. How much? 1683. 683? 683? I couldn't hear him. I'm sorry. I was trying to speak up for him. I don't have my hearing aids turned up that loud. Guess I should, huh? Quite a bit, if you will, weaker, isn't it? Quite a bit. And that makes sense. If, if we turned that over and laid that down, that would make sense to you, wouldn't it? That it would be weaker in that direction. I okay. expected it to be about half. Since, uh, Do what? I said I expected it to be about half since twice as uh, long as it is wide. I guess it's not how it works. Yeah. yeah, 16 high and it's 8 wide. No, can't, yeah, you, you can't make those assumptions at this point. Now, let's do this. Let's do it about that x-axis. Okay, so that was the base times the height cubed divided by 3. So 8 times 16 cubed Divided by three, what's that come out to? Ten thousand nine twenty-three. And that's if you're basically supporting it right here, as opposed to right here. So okay. since we were talking about a two by ten, <coughs> if you had it <coughs> like if you had it hung off another beam in the house. Would that be good? like with just a regular joist hanger? Would that be considered your? Well, where's relax? it? Yeah, where's it supported? It's supported if it's on a, a joist hanger. It'd be supported down here with. Down it. there. So yeah. it'd be the same as if it were sitting on a wall. Basically, you'd still find it at the same place. Right. So well, how would it have to be fastened that you would use the x axis? Well, if you had it bolted through. Yeah, like a like a four by four. You just put a bolt through it, like you would a beam on a deck or something. Or you had a let's say you had a you had made some uh, a plate 
let's say you made a, if we're looking at it from the end, if you made a plate and then ran your bolt through it, but your two by yeah. was okay, that's, yeah. sitting like that. Right. And the bolt, you know, this was like a, not necessarily a plate, but like a piece of hang wire. Yeah. You know, on both sides and you sandwiched it between them. Okay. And that makes sense, doesn't it? That, yeah, that makes sense. That you would get that much more I guess I was just curious if like it resistance. With the joist hanger since it was more of a suspended thing versus sitting on the ground. Well, but so even at that, still, a, a joist hanger if you were looking at a joist on. hanger from the end, it's got this ledge, right, that's that's yeah. holding that and then a, as opposed to sitting on a wall which has got a ledge. So you're essentially you've got the same area there that's holding it up right but probably what's going to fail is the joist hanger <laughs> as opposed to you know it's going to actually the joist hanger wouldn't hold it near as much as the wall would yeah so that's where you're you're not going to get failure in your two by you're going to get failure in your joist hanger would be <coughs> more like what would happen See, now the fun begins, right? <laughs>